Hey, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to American Medicta. We have on with us a new guest, Mr. Richard Walsh. He's the CEO of Sharpen the Spear Coaching, also a fellow Marine. So uh, just to give the board straight to him, Richard, would you tell everyone uh, who you are? Give a good introduction for us. Thanks, Doug. Yeah, really an honor to be here, man. I really appreciate it. I've been looking forward to this. Um, yeah, I've been a little over 30 years as an entrepreneur. So I started my first business back in out of the core in like 87 so 89 and 90 i was a boxer at the time too i was a champion boxer um started working for myself kind of moving up in that started my own business did that for the first 20 years uh 08 09 hit collapsed the economy collapsed i was kind of a luxury item uh my business i guess almost literally evaporated you know uh, overnight. And uh, it was quite something. I had six small children, four years and younger. My wife, of course, and everything was gone. Lost our house, lost everything for a lot of different reasons. I figured out later, uh, didn't know I could be the best making a ton of money and then have it all go away. Didn't think that was a possible thing. So um, we had to relocate, restart, do the whole, you know, start at the bottom of the mountain and climb up again. And we did it. And it was it was something else. Uh, I ended up writing a book called Escape the Owner Prison. I can show it. The contractor's new way to scale, regain control, and fast track growth while loving life. So I connected all the dots of all the things I did wrong. I did a lot of good things, but I put, as I like to say to the left of my desk, a lot of things I should have paid attention to, but I didn't. Okay. So in that, I decided let's write a book. I started helping other entrepreneurs. I helped my own businesses, obviously new businesses, scaled all those. And now I help other people do that. Now I'm a, now I'm a business coach. I have a business coaching business. Uh, and we, and our, our big movement is to help 10,000 business owners create freedom, profit, and impact in their business. Because that's really what it's about. We don't want to be trapped in it. We want our business to serve us, not us serve it. And there's a way to do that. And that's what we show people. You know, I, I want to know, like, the the skills and the the tenets that you learned in the Marine Corps, did that help you with recovering from losing the business? That that drive that you learned from the Marine Corps, did that assist you in that? Yeah, you know we're not big into losing, right? It's not our thing. <laughs> so, you ever see the ever see the meme with the with the mouse maze? I say, you know, Marina, it's just the walls busted through in a diagonal. Oh, I love I love those. Dude, that's so one of my favorites. So that's it. That, that this that's the thousand words I need to say about what I did for that. It's just you don't. I I can't. I get failure. You know I understand failure, right? But the the not getting back up and fighting again, unless I'm dead. Okay, that I don't believe. I'm back up. I'm in the fight. You know the old. If I'm breathing, I'm in the fight. So I do believe that was a big part of <clears throat> what helped me persevere through it. You know, like I tell a lot of people, I also read a lot of books about people who've gone through tremendous difficulties, Doug, right? Ernest Shackleton, right, on the endurance, two years on the ice with 28 guys, touching the void, all this different stuff. Like I said, if you ever think, like, you can't do something, you need to read more. People have done way harder things than you'll ever experience probably in your whole life, especially if you're in the U.S. 
we live a very, very pillowy, comfortable life. Okay. And you don't know suffering, but that will get you through alone that go, man, they did that. I can do this. You know? So yeah, the Marine Corps mentality is a blessing. So we know the Marine Corps mentality side of you. What about being a Christian? It, your testimony wise, how has that assisted you now? Well, that's quite a story, um, actually. So growing up, you know, I, I I told people I was a Sino. I go Christian in name only. You know, there's a lot of those out there. They don't know it. And they obviously don't call themselves that. Uh, but I realized after years, first, I, I, I told you, uh, I grew up a Mormon. I was a Mormon until I was about 17. I loved that. And then went the way of the world. Okay, went the core at 17, all this stuff, you know, and, and did the way of the world. And then started coming up. I still believed I was a Christian. You know, that's what I knew, right? Everyone's a Christian. In America, everyone's a Christian. Kind of was the attitude. Um, thinking I know what that is. As time went by, I was introduced to Christianity, reintroduced to Christianity. Um, started going to church with a friend of mine, a big church. We, matter of fact, we had to be in the gym watching it on the screen because it's so big. No room in the sanctuary. And I'm down there and listening to a little what I call popcorn sermons. I'm um, like, okay, good. I went to church on Sunday, went and did my thing during the week, kind of went back to the world, came back on Sunday to go to church because I'm a Christian, and then back to the world on Monday. And then after a, a while, I got married. We started having children. Uh, we ended up, everything collapsed. I, we moved to uh, Wisconsin, and we're going to church. So we find a church, another church, and then one day I'm typing on my computer, and my wife comes up and she goes, well, who are you email? I go, oh, the pastor. You know, she goes, what for? I go, well, I'm asking about being saved. She goes, what do you mean? I said, well, everyone's got this date, like they've been saved. And and I don't have a date, and I don't know what they mean. Like, they talk about it a little bit, but I don't know what it actually means. Like, isn't a Christian a Christian? She's like, <laughs> she, looks at me and she goes, I don't even know you. I go, well, you got a date? She goes, yeah, I got a date. She gives me this date. I'm like, well, see, you got a date. I don't have a date. Now, I still don't have a date. Okay, just to be clear. So, and either did uh, Billy Graham's wife. Okay, so I think so. Like, you just, I've just become that believer, right? I mean, there wasn't this magical thing. Uh, but as as it progressed, so I'm talking to him, I'm going back and forth, and I'm like, now it's time to spend time in the Word. So I'm like, okay, I really started getting into where, like, what does this actually mean? Because I've been at these churches and go to these big, beautiful churches week after week, and never once was there an altar call. Never once did they say you need to be born again. And like what that means. Like, how can that be, Doug? How can you go and there's like 2,000 people in this church and the pastor never talks about being saved? Like, I, I just, and the logic in my brain goes, well, first thing I'm gonna do is go to a different church. Okay, like I, and I, and I did, and we started doing that kind of thing. And and then I realized, you know, it's it's all about the spirit, right? It's all about the Holy Spirit. And what is that? And I started, started spending that time in the Word every day, every day. And I'm just, I'm reading, I'm doing like a, a Bible in a year plan, but then I'm picking verses, I'm going into it, I'm I'm getting, you know, I'm getting uh, just, just deeper and deeper in this and start to realize, I start seeing the principles, right? I start seeing principles, I'm like, I'm in business, right? I'm growing businesses, I'm growing businesses. Now I'm like, all this, how I kind of operated, not completely, but a lot was like what I saw in the Bible. I'm like, well, this is like the way that this is really interesting. So that just kind of grew into me, us getting to the right church, a very spirit-filled church that is focused on the Word of God and all the Word of God, not 97%. I leave out the 3% that's really uncomfortable, but they stay in it. And that really strengthened my faith. Because for me, you have to be around faith-filled people, right? You know, you, you, you only buy... You know, you draw close to him, he draws close to you. So like, okay, what does that mean? Well, I got to spend time in prayer, right? I got to do that. I want to be around, you know, faith builds faith. Our iron sharpens iron. You know, gotta be, we got, got to be around that. How do we strengthen our faith? Because believe it or not, as much of a tough guy as I was and everything else, faith was, I found myself, I'm going to use the word cowardly, in the items of faith. You know, like, uh, okay, like that tithing, like really you know, given that last cent, the two mites the widow gave, you know what I mean? That you start like, okay, do I really have the courage to do that? The faith to believe what God can do. And he did. And he delivered things. And he delivered so much to me. And I, and he, you know, the, the connection was so unbelievable. Like I've never had an encounter with God right to that point. But then I did. 
and it, I've never been filled with the spirit. The room has been filled with the spirit. You know, I'm not, I'm standing with my hands on the ceiling, praising, like, I don't even know what I'm doing, right? That kind of stuff um, that just drove things home to me. And then I realized here, I've got these six little children that I have to raise in to know God, right? In the way of God, like I just had that responsibility on me. You know, I look at Adam and Eve, right? What did Adam, he had, the, he had one thing to do. He had one responsibility. Keep her from talking to that little clown, right? But he's standing right there, lets her get persuaded, takes a bite. He's going to be out. He goes, and I'm out of my garden pulling weeds because of him. Okay? That's just, that's the And I'm cursing him. I'm cursing at him every time I'm pulling weeds. Okay? But it was it was that kind of thing. I started just understanding this, this responsibility to shepherd my children, you know, the, the protector, the priest, the prophet, the whole aspect of being a man. And that's what, from a testimony standpoint, it's like when you get filled with that, that understanding, you, you operate different, right? You drive different. You see things completely different. You know, you're, you're not, you're in the world, not of the world, right? So I, I started seeing that business. Like if you go in the marketplace, you're going to see some stuff. Okay, if you've ever had real dealings in the marketplace, you're going to see it all over the map. And all of a sudden, you've got a kingdom mindset, and you want to do everything to glorify God, do all things as unto him. Like, you know what that looks like? Okay, people look at you kind of strange. You know, but all of a sudden, you start finding other Christians who have the kingdom mindset in their business, and you start working with them like I did. It's unbelievable. You know, so just continue to strengthen my testimony and of course, my belief in the Lord, but just letting him be the true Lord of my life, not just my Savior. Because a lot of people stop at the Savior part. It's the Lord part that's the challenge. It's that full surrender, you know, doing all things unto him. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. That's a big nutshell, but it's a nutshell. Yeah, dying, you know, dying to self and to be a willing servant, not just for my God, but for my family. You know, as a man. Uh, especially in today's age, you know, you're, you're taught to chase after the money, chase after your dreams. I know that's how I was raised. And, you know, my dad used to tell me, you go where the money is, you go where the money is. And I always hated that saying. And I'm like, I find it kind of true because of my worldly aspect, my worldly view before I was Christian. And then I found that every time I chased money, I just became more unhappy. Right. I didn't like it. And I'm not saying there's anything bad about making money, but chasing after like I envied because I didn't grow up rich. I, I envied and I was envious of people who had these big houses, nice cars. You know, I used to drive down the road and, you know, I tell it to my wife whenever we first got married, you know, we drive down the road to see some mansion dude with a thousand acres. I'm like, there's no reason why I shouldn't have that. There's no reason why I shouldn't have that. And I realized that because there was a hole in my heart that I was feeling that with everything in the world, but the love of Christ. And so the love of Christ, not only did it set this captive free of, of wanting to be of the world and wanting to be envious of everything and having all these stupid things that I can't take with me anywhere. Like if a, if a volcano exploded, which, which one of your 20 Ferraris are you taking, Right. You know, you can't take your, your super cool house and your jets all give them, it's all gone away. Um, so, you know, a, a very humble, meek life serving my family. And what that did was it turned my whole, it turned my paradigm upside down so that I always put myself last. Uh, when, you know, even when I'm making dinner, I eat last. All my kids eat first, youngest to oldest, or whoever comes up first sometimes. So all the kids eat first, then it's my wife, then it's me. And, you know, even when I serve people, that's how I serve people. I am last. I'm not going to starve. But, you know, when there's work to be done, I turn my hand to it first as an example, as a leader. And then I pick up first. I put down last. I get up first. I go to bed last. I get up praising God first. I go to bed last. And, you know, you don't have to do that by my example, but what that does is uh, it, it gives me a day worth of honoring God through my actions, even if I don't have a good day. And we all have those days where we almost struggle to pray. We almost struggle to read our Bibles. And, you know, everybody goes through that. But 
me honoring God with all my actions throughout my day, it reinforces my want to get back into the word of God as like a, you know, I'm going to seal tonight with the word of God. I open today, I open the seal today with the word of God. I'm going to close the book and seal it tonight with the word of God. And that has only done nothing but help me and my walk. Um, Cause if not, I would just be a horrific human being. Um, I want to ask you this. How did you losing your business in 08, 09, how'd that affect your faith? Cause I know that affects a lot of people differently, but how did it affect your faith? You know, it was, it was, so I had, I had this epiphany one morning. So everything's crumbling around me and I, and I woke up and I'm like, I'm in bed, I'm laying there, which I don't often do. I'm usually up and out, but I'm just laying there and I'm thinking about all this stuff going on, right? All this weight on me, everything's, I'm losing everything. These six, I have six kids under four years old, my wife. And I'm thinking, you know, my kids don't care what I drive. They don't care how many trucks I have. They don't care what business I do. They actually don't care what, what house we live in or what town we live in. They don't care about any of that. All they cared about was when I walked in the door, they'd run and attack me because they didn't want to see me. When I left, I literally had one of my, one of my young boys chase me down the driveway crying after my truck. Now look in your rear view mirror and see that and see if it doesn't move you. And if it doesn't, you, you're, you're even worse than I was. I had, <laughs> I had my, my daughters, whenever I would put on my police uniform and I'd get, you know, up early in the morning to go to work, my wife would, you know, make my coffee, my food, see me out. My daughters used to throw themselves in front of the door and scream and cry, daddy, don't go. And it used to worry me. I was like, what is this hysteria about? But you know, five kids later, I, I understand it way more. They, they want dad. Yeah. They don't care who you are. They just want dad. Yes, please it's, continue. It, it, it's so powerful. So that was like, wow. So I've got, I built this fleet of vehicles and I do all this. I'm a world recognized this and that. I'm a steel sculptor. I'm a water feature builder. I got all this stuff and now it's all collapsed. Like they don't care. I said, then I realized the worst one is like, well, you know, if I stay on this path of businesses first, Drive, drive, drive. Everything is business. That comes first. All I'm going to do is teach my children that exact same thing. I'm going to ruin them. They will never have good relationships. Okay, it'll be broken marriages. It'll be no marriages. It'll be just just serving mammon, right? Just serving the business. Make more money. Get a bigger house. Do the be better. Have more have more accolades on the wall. Do that kind of stuff. And now I'm like, I can't do that to them. That is not what I can do. Then I realized at the same time, like my company's name was Rick Rock. You never saw me without a Rick Rock shirt, a hat, work boots. I mean, I was, I was, the business was me. Uh, my identity 100% was my business. Without that, I didn't exist. And I realized, I go, you know what? It's all over now. We got to move, lose not everything else, but I'm never going to do this again. I'm never going to put my identity in what I do. And I even had a little video where I was burning all my uniforms, all my brand new polo shirts I had out of the plastic, right in the fire. I'm just torching them all. I'm like, never, I sold all my equipment. I sold my welders. Everything that I did in that business, include my sculpture, I'm like, and I'm an all or nothing guy, so it's, it might not have been the best move. Okay, because everything is paid for, and that kind of stuff. I don't think, but I'm, if you ask my wife, she'll tell me it's definitely the wrong move. But for me, that's how I do it. So it's that burn the ships mentality. I get rid of everything. I said, I want nothing to do with it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't renew my CDL license. So I'll never be tempted to drive a dump truck again. I'm like, I'm never doing this stuff. And it made it a lot harder for me to get going again, but I was free and I never will put my identity back in what I do. You know, so it's a very different thing. Like even when you look at my website now for Sharpened Spirit Coaching, it's like, I'm not, I'm, I'm there. It's like a founder on the bottom that says one thing. Everything else is about you, the business and your problems. I realize this ain't about me. This is what I'm working. So it really, really shifted my paradigm on how I think about, yeah, I achieved great things. I've done some amazing stuff, you know, but now I know it wasn't me. All my glory goes to God. Every time now it's just like, man, that's just God working. You know, I'm just a vessel. You know, and go back to something you said earlier about that that drive. A great thing I learned from some good good buddies of mine, uh, the Benham brothers. I don't know if you know them, but uh, good friends. We did some coaching together. They said you never want ambition in the driver's seat. You always want it in the passenger seat. It makes a great passenger, it makes a horrible driver. So as long as you can keep ambitions good, we need it. 
right? We got to drive, we got to create things, we got to do things, we got to provide. But if you can keep that in the passenger seat, it's an amazing ride, you know. And that's and that's something I really grabbed onto about eight eight nine years ago, and uh, said that I like that, you know. And that's a good reminder. It's a simple analogy that can really help keep you on track and and keep you focused on what matters. So, how do you deal with the business world as a Christian? I I dealt with it um, with the government, doing business with contractors, scopes of work, and dealing with other federal agencies. And I'm talking about it's a nightmare. For one thing, you'd be shocked at how stupid people are. No, people <laughs> people will surprise you with how dumb they are. And and then you ask them, "How are you a higher rank than me in the government?" And you are this dumb. Um, so, and and it's, it's infuriating and, you know, I just, I want to know, cause like as a Christian, if you did a deal, I mean, look at all the hundred, do you know how many hundred Bidens in the world there are a lot, probably more than there are Christians. Um, and those types of shady dealings that are being done. And I, I, I want to know from your perspective, but also I want to give a secondary question, like to the few Christians who are still at the very tippy top of the military and in the government, how, how do you think they can deal with this corrupt government? Like what's their moral value decision line in the sand? Like I can't do this no more. I got to leave. So, so first let's, let's ask you this as a Christian, how do you deal with the world in business? Yeah. So this is something that I, I actually am quite familiar with. And what I've learned, Doug is, it's about my relationship with Christ. Okay. What I have to do is I can't focus on how bad they do business or how wrong they do business or they don't do business like I do. Again, I'm hearing the biblical principles. Okay. The blessings are in those. Okay. The blessings are in God's boundaries. Okay. And those principles are his boundaries. If you operate in those now, yeah, they're going to do crooked stuff. They're going to do that. I'm not. Okay. So we're called to be salt and light, right? So you got to be in my business. I'm going to operate as salt and light. I'm going to do that. I'm going to follow these principles and people are going to do business with me or not do business with me. Now, do I have a, I'm over 30 years in business. I have some discernment. I know when someone's trying to do bad things, I can smell it. I can see it from a mile away. So I have, but that's a gift as well. That's just one of my spiritual gifts is discernment. And I use that in dealing with the world. Okay. And, 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 just one caveat, just because someone's got a cross on their business card don't mean nothing when it comes down to business, okay? Matter of fact, and this is just my opinion, when I see that, the the radar goes off, okay? You don't need to, you know, you know what promotes it? The Holy Spirit. When you live it, when you are it, people know it. They see it. They don't have to see a cross on my car, on my bumper sticker, on my on my business card, or or some, you know, this whole thing on my business. I'm not saying it's wrong to do. I'm just saying, like, I don't, that's not my, I'm going to sound like a jerk. It's not my crutch. Okay. It is truly who I am. And that comes out in how I do business. They know because I've been cheated by a lot of Christian business owners. Okay. And I, I could share stories by pastors with side hustles. Okay. Talking pastors with side hustles who don't is just so it there there's no it, it's not a given, right? It's not a given just because you're a Christian. Oh, we'd be great to do business with. No. You know, that's why I work with Christian business owners. You know, one of the first things I say, Doug, to people because they want to have a business or they you know, I'll talk to each other, say, okay, so we got a painting business over here, I got a plumber over here, I got me, I do this, and this guy does this. I said, so all you other people, you need a plumber, right? So you're going to call John over here. He does your plumbing. You're going to come over. Now, you know what? I'll tell you what you're going to want to do. You're going to want the Christian discount. You're going to want John to give you a break because you go to the same church and you're a Christian and he's a brother in Christ. And should he give you a discount? I go, is that right? I said, I'll tell you what, I, I better never hear it. Okay. Why should you take food out of his family's mouth? Because you're a Christian, he's a Christian. You want a discount. Because you know what? And, and then I said, let me flip it. I go, John the plumber, you know what you're going to do? You're going to, you're not going to cut any corners. You're going to deliver above and beyond on the value. You're going to give more than they expect or they're paying for. 
but there's going to be an equal exchange right now. If John wants to offer Jim a discount at the end of the deal, that's up to John. Don't come at people like I want a discount because I'm a Christian. Don't expect like, sure, you, you should do it. It's like a donation. Like you, that that's like if my best friend starts a business and I go to him and say, hey, man, can you hook me up? Can you give me, I know you usually charge five grand. Can you do it for 4,000? You know, I mean, we're friends, right? Is that, is that what a friend does? You take you can take profit out of his out of his hands. You're not going to let him feed his family. He's got he's got bills too, you know. So that that that's one of my pet peeves. It just I don't so I and I tell both sides. You're both responsible. You both have a, a part to play in this. And you need to understand that. If you can't afford it, great. You can't afford it. Find another contractor, you know. Or again, if if John wants to lower the price, do that. That's up to him. But they assume this discount because you're a Christian, that's wrong. That's wrong thinking, you know? So I don't know, I know where you're, but I just want to throw that in there because in, in business, you're going to deal with bad Christians, good Christians. You're going to deal with great worldly people who run a good business because biblical princi principles work, whether you're a believer or not, because that's how good God is, right? Like they work, like go do them, go watch what happens. Just take these and go do them and see what happens. Yes, I know you don't believe in Christ, but go do these principles and watch what happens to your business. Oh, look, you're growing, you're scaling. It's amazing. You're making money, right? So that's that's how I handle that, right? You got to be got to be who you are. It's a character thing. Be the salt and light. Follow the, stay in the boundaries, operate your business. You will be rewarded. What about the negative side of that? The, the negative side of, you know, you deal with the shysty people who try to take advantage who try to, uh, or not try to, who do shortchange you on a job. How do you respond to that still in the biblical mindset, but not being a doormat? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I've had these experiences, <laughs> okay. large number experience, not hundred tens of thousands of dollars. Um, for me, I'm very honest about it. I call them out on what they did. I say, listen, let me tell you what you did. X, Y, and Z, you did all this. I'm telling you, that's just, it's unethical. All right. Now, if, if you decide you're going to stay that path, that's great. We're not going to do business in the future together. But I want you to know, I know what you did. And I would never do that to you. I've never done that to any customers I've ever had. So I just want you to know where I stand. But unless you, you know, we reconcile this right now, we're not going to do business together. I want to move on. I'm not going to talk bad about you or any of that kind of stuff, but just we're done. You have to have those hard conversations because if you, you call people out, go ahead. Well, what I was going to say, would you rebuke and then give them the chance to fix it? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Because you, you have to, if that's like asking forgiveness, right? Am I going to deny someone forgiveness? No. Right. But if they come to me, you know, with, with, with a legitimate, with legitimate repentance and they want to make it right. Absolutely. That's what we're supposed to do. Right. How, how if, if you don't, then, then what do you do? You're just telling them to keep doing it. Cause no one really cares. You just talk smack and left and you didn't give a chance to reconcile, you know, and if you don't do that, well, then you're not even, sorry, you're not even, you know, you're not fo following the word. Right. So again, I know there's all different levels of damage and what people do, but no one's beyond repair, right? In Christ, well, all things are possible. Well, you know, I I know that some of the worldly advice, I know because it was given to me when I worked for the government, is, uh, you know, don't trust anyone. Your friends will stab you in the back for profit. And everything is cutthroat, so you should be cutthroat in all your dealings. And for the longest time, that that is actually how I was. I was uh, very unapproachable. I was very good at what I did. But I was, uh, it, it made people very standoffish of me. I never had any complaints about anything I did, but once again, it was standoffish. Um, and I was just very hard nose that nope, my no is a no, my yes is a yes. This is policy, this is law, this is the way things are done. You didn't do it, here's your write up. And I, there was no forgiveness, there was no second chance. You're a grown man, you're in a grown man's job. You knew what you should have done. Here's the repercussions. I am Mr. Repercussions. Here you go. And, um, you know, as a Christian now, it's really softened my heart to think way differently that, hold on, I am not Mr. Perfect. I make plenty of my own mistakes. 
Um, and there's a grace there. There's There's got to be a limit of grace there. Everybody needs to be extended a limit of grace. And, you know, it's it's dealing at, at your level, dealing with that cutthroat mindset. How did that affect you? Well, I'll tell you, I am I am not who I used to be either. OK, so like you said, you know, the Lord will soften around your corners, you know, any any better. OK, it should happen to you um, again. How I deal with it is how it's really. It's, you know, my my tagline for Sharp and Spirit Coaching is honing entrepreneurial warriors on the battlefield of business, right? So this is my mindset. I still have the warrior mindset, you know, those more spiritual now. But in the world, you have to prepare for this. You have to anticipate this. How do you protect your business? How do you shore up your stance on this? You know, persecution is going to come. That's the one thing we're promised in this world. Right. If you're not going to prepare for it, how are you going to respond for someone to someone? Right. How are you going to when they start talking inclusion and they want to know and all they want to hear is what they already hear in their head. They don't want to hear your opinion, but you're going to give your opinion because you're that person. And then then the, you know, the, the wrath of hell all comes down on you. You know, the world, they come on, they hurt you. They ruin your reputation. They, they slam you on social media and all that stuff. Are you prepared for that? You know, how do you show up for that? What does that look like? Right. So there, there is a preparation that we all as believers, we all have to prepare for. If you're in business or not, you've got a you got a way worse chance of something happening if you're an employee somewhere. Like I can actually build, I can actually build preparation. I can actually build defense in my business. As an employee, what can I do? I gotta show up and punch the clock and sit down and do my work. You know, if I say the wrong thing or don't pronounce a pronoun properly or whatever, who knows what will happen, right? Like these people are like they're on pins and needles every day. You know, I see it. I walk in and kind of chuckle because I'm not under that kind of thumb. But but that's what it is, right? That That's what we're up against. And that's and this is the that's the easy stuff. It's going to go deep and it's going to be it's going to get criminalized. All this yeah. is it's going to get criminalized, right? Because first it's it's what how, how does it go? It goes like tolerance acceptance, appreciation, celebration, criminalization, right? They'll, they'll criminalize those who don't aren't celebrating. You know, they want they want you to take through all those steps. Oh, we just want to be, you know, we just want to be left alone. We just want to be, you know, oh, we don't care what you do in your bedroom and all that, you know, all that kind of stuff. You know, you know where that's going. If you've been around long enough, you see where all that the ceiling always becomes the floor, as they say, right? So they get this and this. And so your business is not, it is not, um, is 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 not shielded from that. You're going to have to interact. You know, love to have a parallel economy with all great, true believing Christians. I'd love to have the parallel business economy. Wouldn't that be amazing? Okay, probably not going to happen. Okay, I would love it, <laughs> but but we got to deal with. We're in the world, man. We got to deal with it. We got to fight. We got to be the salt and light. We we got to go to battle. We got to fight that spiritual warfare that's out there because that's what all this is. Yeah, absolutely. You know and. The moment you hit that level of success, um, and being a preacher now and, and preaching to young men has been the one of the most fulfilling things in my life. And one of the things that I I have I've seen this happen within the past few months with a few different men that I've preached to, you know, calling them out of the darkness, teaching them about Jesus, leading them to repentance through Christ because they were too scared to do it they didn't want to do it or they they thought that being a christian was like effeminate right and then they come to christ they're emboldened they're seeking repentance they're reading their bible they're getting filled with the holy spirit you know still babies in christ but then this thing happens satan comes he sees your success and he comes and he does everything he can to destroy it or have you destroy it, honestly. Are those, has there been those times in your life where you just, you hit a level of success, everything's going right for you, and you meet the devil in the three piece suit who just like, hey, you know, Rick, um, I can make you even wealthier if you just sell out to me. Do some of these things, we'll work together. I don't like your 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 morality and your Christianism. So let's let's try and you know help you help me, and we'll see where this goes. Because that's that's what Satan does to successful people. 
and you can see it in our own elite. You can see those who are standoffish from everyone else, and they're ostracized, and they're very successful. And then you can see those who are very successful, and you see them at the Marima Abramovic parties eating, you know, cakes that look like a human body, or at spirit cooking, or at some other disgusting thing that is antichrist. Um, have you seen that in in your time? So what what it is? It, it's all compromised by degrees, right? Because Satan doesn't work like here. I'll give you this pile if you just do this. Doesn't work that way in my experience. It's little compromises. It's whether it's a cutting a corner or saying, "Hey, I'm a, okay. Listen, I'd love to send you some more business." How about we go out? Let's talk about this and stuff. And all of a sudden you have dinner and you're talking about this stuff. And it's like, well, what if we did this? Could you do that for me? And they would change like it's a it's a corner shave. You know, if you do this, like I can give you a lot more profit. You know, if you want to get this kickback over here, right? You start going, you know, you're buying, you're paying you know, 140 a ton. Now I can get this for you for, you know, 79 a ton. You go through 1,500 tons a year. Can you do that math? That's a lot of money to put in your pocket. You know, and all I need is... You take care of me with this, right? So you get a lot of that. That's the downhill slope. That's where it begins to go downhill because you start making these little compromises. You see that little bit of money to make, right? A little bit more, just a little bit more, a little more profit. All of a sudden that starts to stack. Now it's a real number. And now you're caught in that web, right? And now with every compromise, it becomes easier to compromise. We've all done that probably in some some area of our life, right? From when we were kids or whatever, we'll do this to get that. Our parents here, do this and I'll give you this. Okay, just a reward, do that thing. I'm not saying that's Satan. I'm just saying like, you know, we're kind of trained like, you know, reward, kind of risk reward. You got this, do this. Um, so that I saw. Then I got, I used to work in the city of Chicago, not for the city, but they brought me in, Mayor Daly, hand chose me to be on the uh, Fountain Task Force, it was called. So We'd meet, me and some architects and stuff. We'd meet in a room once a month and they put out some plans. These water features are going to be around the city. We'd divvy up like six, seven million dollars. Okay. All right. See you later. See you next month. Right. And it's all about like who's taking care of who. It's the city that works. That's the nickname, right? That's because it's all about the, who's getting greased. Right. So all that, I didn't really, I'm just thinking, well, that's, that's a decent design. Wow. Well, that's going to work. I'm like literally like doing what I'm supposed to do. And they're all taking care of their buddies. Right. They're all just, you know, $150 million, no bid contracts, you know, stuff like that. Like that is, you know, you're in thick. Right. And now I'm getting pictures with the mayor and we're going to all these events, my wife, all this stuff like that's the suck. That's what sucks you in. Right. All of a sudden you're, oh, wow, this kind of, oh, wow, I'm on the paper. I'm in this. I'm published. I've been on TV. I'm winning awards at these big things. And the mayor has come to my world class exhibit and he's supposed to leave in 20 minutes. And he stays there an hour and a half because it's so amazing. And the, the whole thing, right? It's just this big draw that pulls you in piece by piece by piece. And if you're not conscious of it, all of a sudden you're in hell. That, that's where it is. All of a sudden you can't get out because the hole's too deep. You know, so luckily I didn't get deep because I just had this, again, a little bit of discernment. I didn't want to, even before I was saved, Doug, like I operated principally. My dad taught me that, right? It's just, I just did the right thing. You know, the problem with that is if, if so, you know, I said like biblical principles work, whether you're a believer or not, when you're not and you're in those, super easy to compromise because you're not serving the Lord. You have principles you can stay in. It's a, it's a roadmap, but you don't understand why you're traveling it. You have to understand why you're traveling, who you're all things unto him. When you know that, there's a whole different level. You're not going to be, be drawn into those compromises for the most part, right? But again, it's all where your head is, you know, who you're serving. Like you said, there's this lure of money, easy money, hard money, lots of money, whatever that is. Like, again, it's that ambition in the passenger seat. Because I want to be successful. I want to earn money so I can do more with it to help more people, right? Help more businesses and everything else. So that's good. But I have to do it correctly. That's the difference, right? Because, man, I can make a lot of money really fast the wrong way. People do it every day, right? But there's no reward at the end of that. There's no reward at the end of that. You're going to be in a mountain with a pile of money all by yourself. That's, that's what you're going to get. And you have no relationship with the Lord. You have nothing. 
you know, so it's pretty hollow. And I know people always say that, well, let me find out. Let me make all the money. And I'll tell you, it really is. I'm like, well, I think you should take other people's experience on that, you know, but especially if you spend any time in the word. Nothing is talked more about in the Bible than money. Think about that. I don't know, 2,500 different things on it in the Bible. Why? Because it's security, right? The number one human core need is security. That's what money represents. You know, the people it represents security. You know, I can live, I can eat, I can buy a home, I can do this, I can do that, I can get more things. You know, there's a, there's a lot of stuff to it. So it's a it's a twisted thing, you know? Yeah, the adverse of that is wanting to make money to be sustainable and wanting to make money because I want to make more money. I know, I'm not going to say the name, I know a guy who, it's creepy, loves the smell of new money. A lot of you know who he is. I'm not going to say it, um, but it, it's to me, it's creepy when you see people who they, you know, they, especially for Christians. That's why I'm so weary of when I meet very successful Christians, especially people who they make money off of speaking about God. And I watch mannerisms like, you know, like a, we were talking yesterday in our four hour introduction to each other. <laughs> Um, you guys missed all the good stuff. Yeah, that was that's quite a story. Um, when I when I was working in prisons, I became a human lie detector, and I can't turn that side off of me. Like I will find out immediately when you start lying by the way you 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 look, the way you're talking, the way you're looking around, uh, the the fidgeting with your hands. I I I watch everything, and. Some of these guys, man, it's all about money. It's all about making money. And, you know, and my God loves me so much. He let me make so much money. And I hear that. And I just cringe. I'm like, yeah. where, where is Jesus in that saying? It's absent. So you have God wants you to be successful. I mean, Abraham was a wealthy man. Abraham was a very wealthy man. Job was a very wealthy man. But on the other part, you have where, you know, one of the guys asked Jesus, Hey, I want to follow you. Jesus told him because he knew he was a wealthy guy. He says, All right, go sell everything. Come follow me. But he couldn't. He wouldn't because he was in love with his things, with his money. And, you know, there's a fine line. Like, I need my house because it provides safety and shelter. I need food to feed my kids, right? I need the basics of life. But did you need your 19th plane? Did, did you need all this other crap? And, you know, for people, and people don't tithe, people don't do alms, people don't just give out of the goodness of their heart. God loves a cheerful giver. Most people now, because of the economy, they'll say, well, because of the economy, I'm going to keep every penny, but 10% is owed to God. 10%. So you're robbing God because you think the economy is bad. Did you miss a meal? The light's still on. Like give to God, so to the kingdom first, right? Um, that's the loss of faith. Yeah, that's the loss. That that is the loss of faith. That's what that is. That hold on to that. Like given will be given. Like test them. Be hey, that, used, that used to be me. I'm not gonna lie to you. You know, like, me too, man. Uh, I'm yeah, <laughs> different. You know, I said this. That's that's what I mean. You talk about courage and faith. Get out your wallet. Yeah. You know, and, and one thing I learned, Doug, because people would ask me because they go, oh, you know, the church just wants their money. And they go, this guy absconded with it. Or this guy, you know, Miss I go, I don't care. You know, I don't care. I didn't give it to him. I'm giving to the Lord. The Lord will handle him or them or that church or whatever they do with it. That's it. I gave to the Lord. That's who I'm giving to, not to Pastor John or this church or whatever. It's like, this is the Lord. This is where I deposit it for the Lord. Okay. But it has nothing to do with the actual use of the money. It's your willingness to part with it, to give it, be a cheerful giver. That's what it is. And people go, well, I go, you never thought of it that way? You're not giving to the church. You're giving to the Lord. This is just a stupid building. We were given to the Lord, man. He's looking at your heart. Look at Cain. We'll go all the way back. You know, Abel gives the first fruits. He gives the best he's got. Cain gives some crappy stuff that he had, and he gives him the second vein. And boom, he knows your heart. You know, that's all it was. And what did that cause him to do? 
kill his own brother. You know what I mean? I mean think about that. Like in the simplest way, when you think about that, like this is, that, that, that's one of the greatest tests of faith is that is is that money, that security, right? That's like you're giving away your security. So that's that's a good that's a good segue straight into this next question. How do you balance being a Christian and making money and wanting to be a go getter? How do you how do you balance those two so that one doesn't overcome the Christian value? Because in in my experience, right, and I'll just use my experience. In my experience, um, when I was making you know well over ten thousand dollars a month working for the government. I was like, hey, I'm finally where I need to be. And uh, and I just sought after next deployment, next thing, next thing, next thing, try to be as successful as possible because in my mind, success meant dollar bills in the bank account, which is stupid because with our deficit in the economy and because of laws wrote by Congress, all those ones and zeros in the bank account in a heartbeat can be flash gone and now they're used to pay off the debt. So your money is on. If it's not in your hand, in my in my mind, a lot of times it's not really there. It's it's faith in ones and zeros. It's all a faith based system. Um, but but hey, you know you're a go getter, right? You know you 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 see a problem, you got a mission, you you say I know how to attack the problem, and I know how I can be successful at the same time. How does that? Uh, how would what would be your advice for a new entrepreneur, a new Christian who's also being successful, not to let the one capsize the other? So here's here's the importance of it, right? Everything has you have to have a plan, okay? Whether that we, in business we'll talk exit strategy, right, from the beginning. But in this case, let's just talk. I give you a thousand dollars, okay, and every week I say, Doug, I'm gonna give you a thousand dollars every week, Doug, okay. For the next 10 years, you get a thousand dollars from me every week, four grand a month. It's yours. And you go, Oh, that's great. So here comes Richard. And here comes a thousand dollars in cash shows up every week. You grab the cash and then what? I'll put it in my right pocket. Next week I'll put it in my left pocket, you know, but then I'll go buy some for the kids and I'll buy this and I'll buy some extra food. I'll pick up a bike for the kids. Oh, I got five kids. I'll buy five bikes. I get all this stuff right. Next thing you know, four months has gone by and you have $500 of a thousand a week for five months, right? Because you didn't have a plan for it. Now you got things you can't really account for them. You go, oh, yeah, I buy bikes. We go out to dinner. I, hey, I bought them a four wheeler, you know, and they're on that and everything else, you know, that's all cool. But it's called Parkinson's law. If there isn't a, a directed place for your money to go, it will evaporate. Okay. So 10% goes to tithe and 5% goes to here. And I want to do this. So what I do is say, okay, so what I want you to do is make a plan for this money. You're going to grow your business. You're successful, right? You're making income, high income. You have what's called active business income, right? So, Hey, I'm doing, okay. I'm making, you know, $70,000 a month now on the top. It's great. Like, wow, this is really good. Well, what should I do with this money? Okay. A lot of ways to go, right? Tax strategy, all this stuff. And, but really it's like, Here's what I tell people. If I'm in a business and I'm going forward, I'm growing, I'm making money, I'm delivering, you know, the best I can, high value, getting getting great earnings. What I want to do is take my active business income and I want to create passive income, which means assets, right? I want to invest my money into whether it's real estate, commercial real estate, single family homes, a business, whatever it is. So it starts generating me monthly income without me working right? Without me running my business. So let's say, hey, I I, I make seven figures in my business. I'm making a million a year. I take home. Okay. I got seven figures. I need to replace that because when I get out of business, then how do I make money? Right? So I have to figure out, okay, I need about 83,000 a month then. All right. I need $83,000 a month to hit that, hit that 1 million mark. So I got to start taking a portion of my active business income and investing in assets that are going to return me more money. Right. And, and there's a lot of different vehicles for that. But whatever that plan is, you need to start executing that. So the goal, say, in 10 years is I can replace my active business income. Now, let's say you're loving your business. You don't want to get out of your business. OK, great. But now you can stop taking that salary and you can reinvest in the business. That $80,000 a month you were making goes right back. And now you grow your business. You help more people. You deliver more product or service or whatever that is. Right. Because you're probably one of the bigger drains on the company anyways. And that's how we look at it from a business standpoint. Now, let's get to the balance part. 
right? We're now, okay, so, hey, I'm a million, I'm making a million a year, you know, which is, and I'm just going to say it's like, it's good, but it's not great. Today, with inflation, and what's, <laughs> she's worth, you look at a million, a million used to mean something. Now it's, they send 40 million a year to the Taliban, a week rather. They send 40 million a week to the Taliban. You know, so it's not, it's not a lot, but it's a lot, right? You'll be fine. But I'm just saying now, now what do I do with the rest of my life? How am I operating as a human being inside this, inside this cycle, right? My active business income, my, my passive business income. What am I doing with the rest of my time? If I bought my time back, am I able to have balance? Do I do, can I focus on faith and family and finances and friendship? you know, and fitness. Can I do all five of those things while I'm making a million dollars a year personally? Can I do those? How am I doing that? Did I but use that money to buy my time back, to give myself margin in my life? Because again, Doug, this is focusing on this stuff. This is how you keep the balance. The problem is you go buy some boats and you take your buddies out and you go hang on this and you do, and it's all about having a good time. That's not balance. That's out of balance because all you're focused on the fun part. Okay, those five Fs, you get into that. That's work, right? But you can not, now, now your attention has a place to go just like you had an intention for your money. My faith, my family, my finances, my fitness, my friendships. You know, I have to divide that up, right? There's only so many hours in a day. And that's really how you do it. I know that seems that's a little high level. But when you think about it, like it's all about intention. You know, you can be a great leader. You can be you can be a hard charge. And again, even with ambition in the, in the passenger seat, you're driving hard. You're making great money. But your own personal respect and respect is going to come from being balanced. The people who respect you because you made a lot of money. They don't know you. Right. They, they, they're looking at a scorecard. They're looking at a scorecard and it's money. And that's how a lot of people keep score. If you keep score by the dollar, by your revenue, like that's another thing we talk about. Uh, there's a great saying that's really good. So people, I'll get with clients and they have a business. Hey, I'm I'm doing 10 million a year gross revenue. I said, okay, well, how much are you taking home? What do you mean? Well, like, how much do you make? Well, I have about a hundred thousand. I go, wait, your company's generating ten million dollars and you're taking home a hundred thousand dollars. That's a broken system. Okay, there's a problem here, and here's the problem. So there's a great saying I learned years ago. Revenue, gross revenue, feeds the ego. Profit feeds the family. Okay? That is the take-home. That Because I don't care if you're making $10 million, if you can't only take home, what, hundred grand. You know, there's guy Doug, you're working for the government, you're making hundred grand. Okay? This guy's running the $10 million company. He's taking, because he's not, all he's focused on is the gross revenue. Right? And that's not, that's not what you take home. So again, that's that's a misdirection on your finances. That's not focused on your finances. That's focused on showing off. That's ego. Yeah, that's you know, I- that that falls right in line with a, a question we have from Patreon. Um, you know, thank you to all you who are on Patreon. You're you guys faithfully keeping this ministry funded every month is the reason why we're able to do what we do. So thank you very much. So I have this one question from Patreon for you, and that's from Christy. She's a uh a, a bookstore owner. She said, how do you keep from being consumed by the business? Yeah, <laughs> that's my favorite question. That's why I wrote this book, Escape the Owner Prison. Okay. That's what happens. Um, how do you, how do you, here's what happens. So it really, and, and let me give you the, the nutshell, like it's about systemization. It's about process. It's about processes. And even the simpler term is three things. You automate, you delegate, and you eliminate. Those are the three things you have to do in the business. Automate whatever you can, whether it's your books, invoicing, other processes, right? People can, so it's duplicatable. Someone else can do it. Delegate. I don't care if it's one or two employees, if you have. Delegate. Give them authority. Like, not just tell them what to do and show them how to do it. Give them the authority to do it, to run things. And the third one's eliminate. So we want to eliminate redundancies, inefficiencies. And here's the best part. I want to eliminate you. I want to take you out of the equation. You know, if, what if you left for a week? Who opens the store? What if you left for a month? Can you come back and your store is still operating? Is it profitable or is it closed down? What about two months? What about three months? How can you do that, right? So it's the mindset. It's really a systems thinking mindset that to say, well, how do I make this run without me? How do I take me out of this? 
Because no one, when, when you're in the business, especially a, a, a book like yours, Christy, a, a business like yours, but it's, it's tough. And I have no delusions that it's like a piece of cake to do in that industry, but I applaud you for doing it. And it's a, I love bookstores. My wife said, you come to our house, you think our house is a bookstore. People will come over and say, well, if I homeschool my kids, do I have to have this many books? Because it's just everywhere. But I love it. But that's what you have to do. You have to, you have to automate, delegate, and eliminate. Just think about those three things and what does that look like? How do I systemize what I have? And that's what you, because you have to make time for you. Yes, you can do everything, but until you can pull back and say, well, now, how do I, how do I spend time with my spouse? Oh, I have two kids. How do I spend time with my kids? I got to be here from 830 in the morning until seven o'clock at night. Then I go home and keep thinking about it while I'm working on the books. And then I get a call because someone's trying to break in my store and I got to, you know, you know, the whole thing. Right. So these are the things you have to look at from a higher view and start to strategize and build strategy to start to overcome that. It's not overnight, but if you have a plan, just like with your money and everything else, you can do it. Rick, here's the final question. And, you know, I, I guess the way we're looking at the future, well, it's two questions. The way we're looking at the future for one, people invest a lot in the stock market. I used to, um, I don't really that much anymore because I don't see faith in it. I don't have faith in that. Um, and so I don't think that's a, a safe place to put your money. I know a lot of friends put their money in Bitcoin. And for a while, man, they made a ton of money. I, I have a friend of mine who made 500000 in, I think, two years off of Tesla. And that's all gone. It's not climbing like that anymore. It's kind of like it's hit its ceiling. It's not really... There's no sporadic changes where people are making money and now people are investing in these little miniature micro coins. You know, yeah. you know, I own a billion shares in something that's point zero to the 20th power one cent. And if it ever hits one cent, I'll be a billionaire, right? Um, I don't think that's like the proper place to put money, but I'm not gonna tell people where to put money. But like when you look at small businesses. They're being attacked by the government, by the IRS. They want they want small businesses completely canceled. We saw that in 2020. Mm -hmm. Walmart was allowed open. HEB was allowed open. Mom and pop shops weren't. And then we have this whole influx of the illegal migrants coming in that will replace you for not wanting to go take those jobs. So it forces a lot of people to start their own business and they barely survive. Like I know in my area, the most common business that has started is mowing grasses for people like lawn, lawn maintenance. And dude, that's hard work, man. And in Texas heat, it gets, you know, well above 100, 110 to 120 it really depends on how the wind's blowing. If it's cool or yeah. not, maybe 115 for you. So where do you see the future of small business? So, the future of small business is really going to be, it's going to be providing, right? You have to pr provide a service or product that, and you have to, you have to think about AI. Okay. That's all the thing now. What I, I think what people don't get, and I was on a call this morning um, and a marketer was telling me how I, AI won't, won't replace them. Right. And I'm like, I don't see, I'm just looking like, yeah, you haven't investigated AI. Its ability to grow and expand and think and alter is mind-boggling. Like, you don't have five years. Because I was talking about the service and trades business. Like, I'll tell you, if you want to get in the business, be in the service trades. Okay? If you're a plumber, HVAC, you're a builder, right? That, to me, is the new white collar. Because the AI is going to come in and it's going to get rid of the financial guys. All the traders, all that kind of stuff, that's all going to be gone. Even a, a, a huge portion of the doctors will be eliminated. Okay. All again, lawyers gone. Okay. 60% of the workforce is going to be deplete, is gone, is deleted. Okay. But AI can't sweat pipe, it can't frame a house. Right. Now, I know there's technology that helps things, but those are what they call durable trades, right? They have lasted forever. Like you're going to start a business. Skill up on that if you've got it and go provide that service. That's going to protect you better than anything else. Now, in order to another point you were making, Doug, you're talking about Bitcoin and Wall Street and all that. I agree that you want to invest in tangible assets. Okay. Tangible means you can touch them, feel them, you own them. Okay. It's not in some spreadsheet on Wall Street. 
Okay, we know where that goes, right? We've seen it. We saw it in 2000. We saw it again in 09. I mean, it, I don't know, you know, I've been around long enough to see it multiple times. So let's say over time you're you're buying little single family homes and all of a sudden you've got 30 homes, rental homes, and it's producing that great income you want. Well, if things get tight, you can sell one. You can pick up 80 grand, 100 grand because you own it and you're able to do that, right? You can liquidate a tangible asset. Right. And it still takes some money and still have plenty more to keep creating that passive income. So I think tangible assets is something you want to look at. And that could be even investing in another business. You have a guy who is, say, an SME, subject matter expert, really good at it. You've got some money. You can help capitalize them, get them off the ground with an agreement. Hey, I'm going to get 20 percent you know, or whatever the 10 percent. I don't care what, whatever the number is. You launch them in a the business. You're the investor. Now you're making a return on that way better than you ever get on Wall Street you know, in some mutual fund or something like that, right? So you can do things like that. So you can look at that. But again, what's that business, right? What are they doing? Are we thinking along these same lines? Durable trades, a service. Yeah, cutting grass is good, but eventually people can't afford to have their grass cut. You know, so like, okay, it's good and it's not good. You know, there's a certain clientele that always have their grass cut and the other market's going to go up and down. Because the cool thing about landscape, because I grew up in the golf business and cutting grass in my first business, landscape business, there's there's the guy with the beautiful truck and the trailer and it's wrapped right. He's got all the zero turn mowers. He comes out, and does him, everything's perfect, and you got the edgers and five guys. You got that, and the dude's paying you know two hundred bucks a week to have his grass cut. Then you got Jimmy over here with the beat down you know twenty year old pickup truck with a push mower and a blower in the back, and he's doing it for fifteen bucks a week, right? But there's a market for both of those guys. They both can make money. You just find the market that wants to pay fifteen. The two hundred dollar a week guy does not want to pay fifteen dollars. If you push in your lawn boy, uh, his yard, okay, he doesn't want that. But he wants the show, right? He wants the perfect lawn, all that. So there's a market for everything. So don't get me wrong; like there's there's a place for it, but decide where you want to go, right? So from the business, when you and I, I encourage, especially Christians, at one point in this country, we're over seventy percent entrepreneurs, business, everything else. Now it's under thirty percent. You know, COVID really knocked those numbers down. Um, so I, I just encourage people to get in there, but be careful where you start. Okay, you need you need you need a lot of planning to really understand what what you can do, what it looks like to start and run a business, scale a business, so you're not stuck in that two year cycle doing the same thing over and over again, where all of a sudden you just kind of capped out and it just becomes a burden. So you got to be careful with that stuff. I do have a startup program, a course I created uh, that people can take a look at on my website. Uh, it's a 16 week course, but man, if you complete that course, you will exponentially increase your chances of success because 97% of all small businesses that start fail in the first five years. So as I like to tell people, you got a better chance of being a Navy SEAL. Okay. That's only a 90% fail rate. So, so you just gotta, you gotta think, keep things in perspective, but the more you can increase your probability of success, the better off you're going to be. What do you think about investing in gold and silver? Now, I say that to say this. I know guys who invest in luxury cars, Rolexes, firearms, stuff that they think has value in a small niche market where gold and silver, platinum, palladium, these things will always have value, but that value fluctuates. Is it a wrong investment? To say, and I know guys during COVID who did this. I worked with a few guys. They bought this like, you know, $200,000 sports car and they kept it in their garage and they, everything was going wonky with COVID. And so they put more or less themselves as the dealer for this car that they bought and they hyped up the price by like 50 grand and no one bought it. And still to this day, I mean, that was almost four years ago, or it is four years ago, no one's bought that car. And so I'm like, that's not really a good investment, man. Like, well, yeah. when one day the the you know the bottom will will drop out and it'll be worth it. I'm like, when when our money's not worth anything, your two hundred thousand dollar car is not gonna be worth anything either. Right. That's not a good investment value. So yeah. what do you think about that? Yeah, that a uh, vehicle's a liability. I don't care how you look at it. The longer that thing sits every year, things are drying out, getting older. It's not, it's just losing value every day it sits in your garage. 
you know, and now as a business owner, you can have a depreciating asset. You can buy vehicles and use them, right? And you can write those off and things like that. Gold and silver is real money. Always has been. Okay. Always has been. And it always corrects back to gold. So whatever the fiat currency is, it all gold always wins. And you look at it through eons of time and what's had all the cycles you look at it. So to me, it doesn't mean you put everything in gold, but look what states are doing. Like Texas, like Utah. Okay, that's becoming a currency you can operate in. They're actually starting to give you a debit card. You can get a debit card based on gold. Okay, the state is the merchant, right? You know, you, you know where you pay your 3% because you use your debit card or whatever. They're the merchant, but it's all based on gold. And here's the deal. When that gold goes up in price, you don't get a capital gains tax on that. So that thing can increase. And now, and you can buy as little or as much as you want, right? And you and it's literally attached to a debit card. There's one called, I think it's called the Glint right now that's out there and you can do that. But these states are starting to do it because you know how much money they'll make processing that? They're finally getting like, oh, wait a minute, because they're all broke anyways. We can start trading in real gold, real silver, it's still digitally tracked, if you will, right? But you don't have to walk around. What are you going to do with a gold bar? You're going to buy a candy bar with that? You're going to cut off a piece? You remember, like, back in Athens, they they, they, they snip off a pinch of your coin because they kept adding zinc and everything else to it, that gold coin. So that was the tax. They'd cut, literally cut your coin. Well, we're going to start doing that? No, but if they, they put it digitally. Now, now you can go buy a dollar fifty worth of something. You can buy $150 worth of something is off gold. And you've got that price. Yes, it may go up and down, but people have to remember. I know we're going to hold financial uh, history lesson here, but pre 1913, the inflation rate in our country from the inception of the com country, right, 1776, was actually at a negative. Okay, it didn't change at all. A penny was worth a penny from 1776 to 1912, it still had the same value. Right, and none of these games that were played. So, you do a whole episode on fiat currency, man. It's unbelievable. I'd be right by your side. <laughs> All about so. So, I said, but gold and silver, man, that's it. It should be part of your portfolio, and it should be on your person. Yes, you can have the state issue. Only a few states are doing. It. I think it's Virginia or West Virginia. Texas is trying to get it done. Utah, there's a few others, but that's a good thing, though. But you still should also have gold on in a safe on your person because you're not going to be able to call some and get it when, you know, the bad things happen. Um, and don't forget the chickens and the lamb and everything else you can barter with. <laughs> the ammo, like I can I, I can trade a box of ammo for two chickens. Okay, <laughs> it's like, there's good stuff. There's things that we're going to be able to do, you know? Just got to be a little bit smart. Yeah, you know, as a, uh, from the farmer mindset, one of the things that I harped on a lot of my buddies who they put their investments in all different types of stuff. And I said, you know, and they'd ask me, like, Doug, what's your portfolio? You know, what do you do for your investment? I said, honestly, I am I am your investment. My goal is that I want to be the investment. You want food? I'm your investment. You want a good chicken dinner? I'll be your investment. You want some scrambled eggs? You want some bacon? You want some steaks? I'm going to be that investment. Because we need farmers with the mindset that the, the meat on the hoof, the, the things that people want to eat every day, that needs to be a good investment as well as your luxury cars and gold and silver. And, you know, this, that trade value there. Now we got that bartering system going on. You want food? I want gold. Right. Um, but, you know, it, it's going to come down to the point that eventually, and this is the way I see it with the unraveling of the constitution now and the unraveling of the country is that when everything breaks back down into its basic form, the 13 colonies mindset of America because when states are dissolved because of whatever, you know, it's going on the antichrist and whatever um, we're, we're going to all fall back into little bitty colonies and we're going to have to have some sort of ad revenue again. We're going to have to have some sort of bartering system again. Uh, gold and silver is always going to be there. You know, tools will always be there. Uh, your ability to fix stuff will always be there. So making yourself a good asset. Mm -hmm. is a very good mindset if i go to a random man i said hey what can you do if i have something broke and i look at his painted nails and the the looped you know thing through his nose and, right. and i just 
Yeah, I'm like you know, with the cattle. Yeah, you're you're not here's a shovel. Go start with the shovel. Um, you're gonna have to build a lot of skill. Uh so you know, I, I want to make sure that I am the vestment. I know how to weld. I am kind of okay with carpentry. Uh the square and level are my enemy. That's like my nemesis. Who needs that, man? You just thumb that. I built my whole giant. <laughs> I, I, I built a luxury chicken coop. I have 60 chickens. That thing is nine foot tall, got a slope roof, got windows, linoleum floor, full perches, everything else, nesting boxes, man. Those chickens live large. Okay. And I did that all by myself, you know? And I, I don't even know if I used the level. I don't even know. I think I just eyeballed it, but it's amazing. Okay. I'll, all I all I know is I'm I'm a pretty good T post driver myself. Uh, you don't you need go. the one attached to the tractor. I'm I'm a pretty good one. Um, but you know, make yourself useful. Don't if you think the best thing you can do is send a funny meme. That is not your level and skill as a man. You need to develop different levels of skill that make you reliable. That's like you know the greatest generation when they finally disappear. Man, the knowledge that those guys are going to take with them is what we'll have to fall back on. If we got hit by an EMP, we would have to fall back on the greatest generation. How do you run the steam stuff again? How did you, how did you do all this machining without all the electrical inhibitors now, right? Uh, how do you do all this stuff? I mean, I know my grandfather, he worked at a paper mill. Well, when you work at a paper mill, you have to get the paper which is coming from trees, which are logs. And it was by teams of mules and men with saws and axes and grabbing by chain and hoisting and blocking and then pulling. And eventually they'd have a tractor trailer sitting there to drive the rest of everything out. Like hard manual labor, Rick. I mean, these guys work 12 hour days for a few dollars. Yep. I think those days will come back. I don't know if the hard work will. I think. I think what you're saying is we, you are your best investment in you, right? And that, and if it's to run a business, you have to invest in you. You're you're running the business. You're the leader. You know, you say you gotta, you gotta, you gotta spend more time developing yourself almost than your business, they say, right? Um, because you have to lead this, you have to have the vision, you have to be able to put this together to take this, this, you have to have a vision-driven business, right? But that takes foresight, that takes understanding, that takes I wouldn't even say education. I don't mean education in the traditional way, public school education. I mean, other like the stuff you were just talking about, of the world. How do people do things? How did Mayans or the Greeks cut stone where you can't even see light through it? Like, it's so perfect. They can't even duplicate it. With cranes, everything they have today, they can't even, they can't even redo what they did. How do they do that? That's lost stuff, Right. Those are skills, man. I because my my thought process is this: we're not getting smarter; we're getting dumb. Okay, we're getting more out of shape. We're getting less physical. We're not getting smarter. We're not doing the things they did, you know, a gazillion years ago, four thousand years ago, and stuff like that. We're getting worse. Everything we die every day, right? So th- there's no maintenance. It's forward or backwards. You only have two directions. There's no maintenance, and the people think they're maintaining. They're kidding themselves. It it doesn't exist. It can't. There's no way that it can exist. So I choose forward. Okay. I still train every day. I love to work out. I want to eat properly. I want to drive my business. I want to, I want to raise my kids properly. I want to, I want to have purpose for the future. I've done a ton of great, really cool stuff in the past, but now it's like, that's all it is. It's ancient history. People are like, you talk about, like, you think about 20 years ago in the Marine Corps, I went in 1983. It's ancient history, dude. Like uh, people, like so, yeah. They, that was like forty years ago. I mean, it was forty years ago. Oh my goodness, that's how much ago. You know, I'm like, and I'm, I'm still just trying to stay dangerous. You know yeah. what I mean? That's what I want to do. So it's, it's. I have to. That's a conscious effort. That's every day. You know, people are getting. They're just soft, man. They're, they're sitting on couches or watching too much TV. They're not. They're not out exerting themselves. And I'll tell you, an hour a day in the gym isn't enough. And I go hard. I got to get out and work in the garden. I got to drag logs. I got to toss stuff. I got to slam things. I have a sledgehammer and a tire and I beat the tire just because. Okay. Because <laughs> like I, I don't get that movement in the gym. You know what I mean? Depending on the gym. But the YMCA not doing that. Right. So th- that's the thing. But so that that's an investment in me. Right. My fitness, my ability to 
to carry my child if I have to or run with them for a mile on my back and they weigh 80 pounds. Okay, can you do that? Are you enough of a man to do that? Man, I you talk about that the all the time. Yeah, I talk about it all the time. You know, we have we have brothers and sisters in Armenia who are being chased out of their homes by the Azerbaijan Muslim armies. And I watched some videos where they were literally scrambling up a mountainside and do like this. That was like face like this. Mm. And, and I mean, old people, kids. And, you know, one of the things I, I stress for dads, dude, you should be a beast. Mm -hmm. You should be a beast. You should be a beast of a man. I'm not saying you should be John Wick, Navy SEAL, all this makeup crap. Um, but and I, I have mad respect for the Navy SEALs. I'm not saying they're made up crap. But like that whole like bravado the mindset. Hollywood. Hollywood, the Hollywood. The Hollywood, Hollywood just, no. Yeah. No, man, if I hit you in the face, what are you going to do? Hmm. Are you going to get mad about it and hit me back? Or are you going to cry? I know a lot of men who will cry, you know, and, and I'm like, look, the world is going to stomp you. Yeah. If you, if you, if you don't pop that bubble you live in, this world is going to violate you and it's not going to stop. So they say it's the government study. If the grid goes down, we're out of power within the first six weeks. 60 million people will be dead from suicide. And I bet the majority of that happens in the first two weeks. No phone, no nothing. I mean, that's government statistics. Yep. I've that's been there the root the studies. I mean, you're going to kill yourself because you don't have power? Oh, hey, look, it, it gets worse than that. I've been here for these talks, okay? Addictions, barbiturates, people that are on pain medication, people that are severe alcoholics, people that are on any type of antipsychosis medicine, right? Um, that first month, mm -hmm. you don't get your fix. What will the mind melt oh. down into when your lizard brain says, time to go do something scary, need a dopamine rush, need some endorphins. Why don't you go rape that lady over there? That'll make you feel better because you know what happens with people with addiction. It's a doorway and you let the devil right in. You let his demons right in. And though you think you got a handle on things, oh, I haven't had anything in a few days. And then you, I, man, you know how many homeless people I've dealt with, encountered, arrested, freaking running naked, uh, fighting, talking with four different accents at one time. Uh, you see this and, and you go, you know, this is happening with the power on. Like, I can take them to the hospital. I can get them a psyche valve. I can get them hot meal. What happens when none of that's there? No one's here to take care of these people. And that's the homeless that's already here. Then the enormous population of the homeless that'll happen for people who are leaving their homes because they have to. Well, I can't stay here no more. The roving bands of of uh, the horde of people are coming door by door in my apartment or in my condos or or in my suburbs. We had to flee. Now we got nowhere to go. People have no idea. You would in look, Rick, people think that because you and I are veterans, that we speak of this only from like a military term. We'll have to deal with it will be suffering right alongside everyone else if the grid goes down which is the government has said is the highest probability is that the grid will go down that's the highest probability that they're banking on within the first year dr peter vincent pry said that it is estimated that 85 to 90 percent of the american population will be dead so that first month to two months you're going to have people who are going to be committing suicide because they don't have social media. They can't take their stupid selfies in the mirror at their gym anymore wearing, you know, tight clothing. You have people who they're not going to have their addictions to suppress the demon in their head no more. They're going to be out and about. Oh, by the way, you're still going to have plenty of murderers and psychos. The the guy next door that was always so kind to you, a little weird. Yeah, when the grid goes down, yeah. That's John Wayne Gacy, your next door neighbor. You just didn't know it. These and and these personalities will be expressed and come out in people because, well, if there's no one to stop me, then who's going to stop me? And there's a lot of those people who think like that. Well, what's yours is now mine, right? Um, I remember the U.S. Marshals in 2016, 2015, 
they busted a group out near Bandera, Texas, where I used to live. And it was a, it was a doomsday cult and a bunch of them were patriots. A bunch of them were veterans and they called themselves the Marauders. The stupidest thing is they had a Facebook page and on their Facebook page, they have a mission manifesto that if you don't join us, when the grid goes down or when, whatever their doomsday was, uh, they're coming to get your stuff. That's that like, you can either fall in line with us or we're coming to get your stuff. And they had built the whole compound. Well, go figure human trafficking and, and, and drugs and all of the stuff was happening there. So they all got nabbed. Good guys won the day on that one. But those people are out there, man. And there's right. way more of those people than you think. Um, yeah. And I mean, like we're and here we are playing around with Russia. And Russia today is like gloves are about to come off. If you guys don't stop yourselves. We will stop you. And China has the ability. Iran has the ability. Russia definitely has the ability. And North Korea has the ability to hit us in our grid and take it down. And that's just a cyber attack. I'm not talking about an EMP. I'm not talking about terrorist attacks. I'm not talking about anything else. Just a cyber attack that the government says we're not ready for it. The grid's not hardened. We don't have the the correct infrastructure in place we have a depleted and failing infrastructure crumbling infrastructure um we we have sent all of our assets in 20 different directions except for helping the american people and the american economy and the american infrastructure we're not ready for a war let alone to actually be attacked in the united states so yeah, it's it's all but this is all designed yeah I mean, this is oh we just forgot to take care of it i mean you know we could spend forever talking about that and i get i'm totally with you and it's you know we go back to like you know it's self-preservation and we talk about business and we talk about you know our connection with the lord and this thing the things that really matter but there are things that we do like you know it's the old saying the guy sitting on top of the house and the boat comes by this the helicopter comes by and keeps saying no the lord's going to take take care of me and then he ends up dying and he says, Lord, why didn't you take care of me? Because I did. I sent a boat and I sent a plane and he didn't do anything, right? Well, we let's not be stupid. Okay, we got to prepare. Okay, there's things that we can do, which and we all have the time. Anyone thinks they don't have the time for that? Okay, I always have this little secret test I give them. They go, tell me how many hours are in a week? One, two. You don't know? If you don't know how many hours are in a week, how do you know you don't have enough time? You can't tell me in a half a second, there's 168 hours in the week. You don't know where to, again, know where your money's going, right? Everything's account. <laughs> you have 168 hours. If you don't know it and you spend, you spend how many on your phone? You spend how many in front of the TV? How many on the couch? How much do you actually sleep? Right? Start adding up these hours and you'll see like you could have two lives with the hours that you have available in a week. You can have your job and you can have a business and then you can flip that. And then you can turn that business into your full-time deal because you have 20, 30 hours a week to work on that business on top of your job time. So like the excuses, I have this equation I've got on the shirts and it's, it's D plus it's D plus a minus E times C equals results is desire plus action minus excuses times competition equals results. Desire is a dream. We all got it. Oh, I got a goal. I got a dream. If you don't take action, nothing happens. And you can't have any excuses. You just got to make it happen. You got to power through. That's that. We talked earlier on the Marine Corps mindset. That's that. It's no excuse. You just get it done. Competition is a huge, it sounds like, what do you mean? I go, we're always competing. You know, we might be competing for our next breath, right? But we're always competing against something, ourselves, competition in the marketplace uh the the next better way to do something that's a competition inside my own business how do i do this better less mouse clicks less you know cheaper product whatever i got to do right how can i deliver this that's where the results come from when you when you put that equation together and you operate that way you understand that like i'm in control of this i'm in control of the things i want i'm in control of the size my business is going to be big or small i don't care what size it is you know, if you want a one-man operation, go for it, but make it incredible. <laughs> make it an incredible one-man operation. Don't just get by. Make it incredible. 
Like use time like to your advantage. You have plenty of it. Stop being caught up in the in the belief of busy. Busy is not productive. That's what busy is. You need to be productive, right? We we call it income producing activities. Like what do you do? Like you and I, we're gonna have a business, right? Well, our, our our goal is to make a great business, but make income. We want to feed our families. We want to keep a roof over our head. We want to help others, right? So we're focused on making our businesses succeed so we can help others. It's it's marketplace ministry. How can I be the salt and light in my sphere, in my, how can I do that? How can I bring people to Christ by what I do? Why do you do that so good? I have a, 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 a custom vanity maker. The guy, his work is so unbelievable. Like, Everything is about he serves the Lord, right? I mean, it's the finest of being people come in all the time and just he does everything as unto the Lord. I mean, I love having him as a as as a client because it's a joy to work with him. Because he doesn't cut corners. We just we just make it better. We just know how to run the business better, how to automate things, like so we can do more and serve more people. And it's that that's what it's all about, though. You know, that really is what it's about. And when you're serving the Lord, man, you don't have you have no greater purpose. Right. We got to put that together and understand that if you want to start a business, understand first who you're serving. Secondly, understand it's work. It's real work and it's good work. You know, there's there's no finer sleep than on a pillow of a clean conscience. Right. Only the laboring man knows true rest. Understand that. Like, man, embrace that. Get out there and get off, off your keister. Get out there and do hard things. I tell our men's ministry all the time, do hard things, guys. Do hard things. If that's raking the stinking yard, go rake the yard. If that's hard for you. Okay, go do hard things. You don't have to go far to do it. Just do hard things, and you'll be a better man for it. You'll be able to serve better at a higher level. You you literally echo everything that I've been saying for like two years. Of course, Marines, we speak the same way. Go outside and sweat. Do something that hurts every now and then. It's good for you. Rub some dirt in it. Stop complaining. Be a man. Uh, Rick, dude, thank you so much for coming on so much words of wisdom i really hope that this blesses people who are in business uh, i know our conversation yesterday was a uh, very blessing to me and uh you know we invite you on this platform anytime you'd like and uh before you leave can you let people know where they can get your book at yes amazon make it simple you can go to amazon you can contact me on sharpen the spirit and i'll tell you what if you jump in my little contact box send me an email and say you heard me on this show, American Vindicta, I'll send you the free audio version of my book. Rock on, man. That's awesome. Thank you very much for that. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that's all we got for you right now. We'll make sure that we try and get Rip back on. Uh, brother, thanks very much for coming on. Simple Fidella, stay frosty. Guys, thank you very much for watching. My name is Doug Thor, and you've been watching American Vindicta. We'll see you next time.
non verba. Deeds, not words. Hey, I'm Dan Lyons, and I'm a personal trainer. I'm here to help patriots understand why they have trouble losing weight. See, the globalists use specific chemicals in our foods, and these chemicals do two things. Number one, these chemicals destroy our ability to create cellular energy from the food that we eat. So this means now we're eating food and we're storing that food as body fat instead of burning that food for fuel. And number two, these chemicals destroy fatty acid beta oxidation, which is your body's own mechanism of burning body fat. So this is why everyone has trouble losing weight. Do you remember how easy it was for you to lose weight when you were in your early 20s? What if I told you that you could get that back? I put together a comprehensive online nutrition course for patriots who want to fix their metabolism and start losing weight again. The course comes with 13 interactive lessons, an optional graded final exam, four downloadable guides, all to help you make better choices while shopping, one beginner sample workout to get you started on your exercise program, a 20 minute abdominal and core workout video, along with much more. Throughout this course, you will have the opportunity to ask me questions and connect with other like-minded patriots. Reclaim your metabolism today. Have you been looking for a trusted long-term storable food company? We have a solution for you. Simply Clean Foods is dedicated to providing the best quality food you can buy next to fresh from a farmer's market. Our line of resealable fruits, vegetables, and meats are suitable for everyday use, and you won't have to worry about throwing away valuable groceries ever again. Our food is completely GMO-free, and our stringent quality controls, plus testing for heavy metals, makes us unique in the storable foods market. Simply Clean Foods' primary focus is to bring clean food to people all around the world and change the way we look at freeze-dried food in our daily cooking. When you purchase from simplycleanfoods.net, not only will you be receiving high-quality food, but you will also be supporting veterans in need across the country and those who are affected by natural disasters. Right now, Amazon Prime members will receive fast two-day shipping. Go to simplycleanfoods.net. That's simplycleanfoods.net. But do it today. Klaus Schwab from the World Economic Forum has said, you will own nothing and you will love it. And that's represented by what's going on across the planet today, where the economy of the world is in free fall. And nowhere is it more in evidence than with our own President Biden deliberately trying to sabotage what we have, access to food, other resources. So Americans are in a unique position, really for the first time in our history. We're going to have to provide for ourselves or subject ourselves to the whim of the government. Do you really trust a government to feed you that left a thousand Americans behind enemy lines in Afghanistan? I don't think so. So where do you go? When you ask the question, who's the best prepper out there today? There's only one answer. Ready Made Resources and Robert Griswold. I call him King Prepper. And that's how a lot of people think of him. You have everything there you'd want from night vision to storable food, how to prepare cooking in emergency situations, books and videos on how to prepare alternative energy, communication, first aid that you wouldn't think of, natural antibiotics, you name it, Bob has it. Now, here's the good thing about Bob Griswold that no one else does but him. You don't have to buy anything to talk to him. If you're not sure where to start with your preparation, no obligation phone call directly to Bob. You can talk to him for free. Most people will charge you an arm and a leg for a half hour conversation. 
That's not Bob Griswold. He cares about helping America get prepared. Go to readymaderesources.com or you can call the number directly at 800-627-3809. Again, that contact information, readymaderesources.com for the best prepping outfit in the country or call Bob Griswold directly, 800-627-3809.